Brought to you by 1AAuto.com, your source for quality replacement parts and the best service on the internet. Hi, I'm Mike Green. I'm one of the owners of 1A Auto. I want to help you save time and money repairing and maintaining your vehicle. I'm going to use my 20 plus years experience restoring and repairing cars and trucks like this to show you the correct way to install parts from 1AAuto.com. The right parts installed correctly. That's going to save you time and money. Thank you and enjoy the video. Okay, little brakes 101. So, you know, maybe you got 50,000 miles on your car and you're wondering, do I need new brakes? Or maybe your car was in the shop and, um, you know, the mechanic put it up on the lift and said, see here, you need new brakes. And he showed you some stuff, but you didn't really know what you're looking at. Uh, well, this video, I'm going to hopefully take care of that for you. Okay, I'm going to show you how these brakes are put together. Um, so that you can identify whether or not you need new pads and rotors. Okay? There's no one mileage for a car. Okay? No one can say, oh, your car has 60,000 miles on it, you need new brakes. Okay? If you drive your car a lot of highway miles, you may go 100,000 miles before you need brakes. If you drive your car around town and you're stop and go all the time, you may need brakes at 20,000 miles. Um, if you've ever seen those people driving down the road and their brake lights are always on, you know, some of them might have a problem, some of them might be riding their brakes, they'll probably need brakes at 5,000 miles. So, um, there's two factors that go in, how you use your brakes and the quality of your brakes. Um, so, no one can just say, well, you've got a certain amount of miles, so you need new brakes. Uh, you need to check the condition and you need to know what you're looking for when you're checking the condition. So, I'm going to take this wheel off and I'm going to show you a few things. Okay, so this is probably what you're going to see. Um, when you when you look at it, a whole bunch of brown and gray, okay. And if you're looking at it at your mechanic shop, um, it's definitely what you're going to see. They're not going to clean anything up for you to try and let you figure out what everything is, okay. But basically, what you have is three main parts. You have your calipers, okay, which is like the arms on your bike when you used to press the handbrake and they'd squeeze the rubber shoes together, okay. So you have your calipers. So those are like the the arms, okay. And then, you can see it move, okay, there's your brake disc or your rotor, that's obviously like the rim of your bicycle, okay, and then between, between your rotor here and this is your caliper, is your shoes, okay, and there's a metal part of the shoe and there's a brake lining part of the shoe, okay, and at this point what I'm going to do is go to a new set of shoe, new set of brakes so you can see the difference between everything better. Okay, so I'm actually now going to perform basically a a brake job for you, real quick. Uh, most cars are like this. There's two bolts that hold the caliper to the steering knuckle. And you can see this uses a large Allen wrench. I'm going to put another wrench on here for some leverage. Okay, and then I'm going to pull these bolts out. And then once you have those bolts out, you can use your wrench and pretty much just pry and pull the caliper off. Okay, so you can see the caliper. And here's your shoes, okay, which are like the little rubber things on your bicycle. That one pulls right out. And then this one basically pull it off like that, a little more force. Okay. Take my caliper, put it up here. On most cars these days, the disc just pulls right off. Okay, some cars you may have a, that may be um, put on with a nut that has a cotter pin in it or something like that. But a lot of newer cars and trucks, the disc just pulls right off. Get our new disc from 1A Auto. And go on just like the original. And here are our new pads from 1A Auto. Okay, a couple little things. Now you'll see it has a little tab right here. Okay, you'll notice that tab is roughly lined up just, just inside of the metal here. Okay, that tab's a wear indicator. Basically, once these pads wear down, that tab will start hitting against the rotor and it'll make that squeaking noise that you hear sometimes. And as soon as you start hearing that squeaking noise, you know that's when you need to replace your pads. The only special tool you'll need um, is a large C-clamp and you probably actually don't need one this large 
Um, but you use this and put it in uh, to force your cylinder back in. And now you'll see as I tighten it up, this cylinder will go down in. Now obviously you want to make sure you don't damage your line or anything here. Okay, and the reason you need to do the reason you need to do that is because here's my old pad. You can see how much thicker my new one is. Okay, so this caliper had compensated by um, staying out some. Okay, so you have to push it back in so you can fit the new pads on. Okay, so this one okay goes in and clamps in to that bore. Okay, and then this one goes like this. Okay. And then, okay, what I like to do is I put a light knot onto my rotor. Okay, that just helps to hold things in place. Okay, and then my caliper just goes right back on. You can see this hook should go down in there, and this hook should go in if everything's positioned correctly. And this is where it's okay to use a little bit of force and make sure your bolt's all the way out. Okay, and then you get your bolts started, you tighten them up. Okay, so these are your brakes, so you want to tighten these up pretty good. Okay, again, use your wrench for leverage. Make sure your Allen wrench is well in that bolt. Okay. okay, and now with the nice new brakes in, you can see everything really well. Here's your caliper, here's your pads in red, and then there's your disc in between. Okay, and you can see the new pads are a good, you know, between probably three eighths, I don't know, three eighths and half an inch or so. Whereas my worn pads, or about half of that. And quite honestly, these pads still have some life left in them. These pads are still probably worth another 10,000, 15,000 miles. Okay, but now you can easily see, and you know, if somebody's trying to tell you you need brakes, this is what you check for. You want to make sure those pads have some good life. And you also want to look at the condition of your rotor. Now obviously it's a brand new rotor, so it's nice and smooth. Okay, here is my original rotor from this car and actually if I run my fingernail on it like this I'm not feeling any deep you want to feel for um, deep grooves around it and I'm really not feeling anything so actually this rotor is in good shape too okay. so actually if I check these brakes the way they were um, I would have left them alone probably for another probably checked them again about another 10,000 miles Okay, but for illustration purposes, that's what your new brakes will look like. Then you can put the wheel back on um, and go from there. Okay, so that's a little Disc Brakes 101. Um, I hope I gave you the tools you need to check your brakes and see if you need new ones. And also, I hope I showed you how easy it is to actually do these brakes yourself. Um, as you're putting this together, you want to make sure that those bolts are tight. Uh, then put your wheel back on, torque your lug nuts to 75 foot-pounds, uh, put your hubcap and everything belts back on, and you're good to go. Uh, 1AAuto.com, we sell the pads and rotors for many different makes and models, and we hope this helps you out and can save you some money. We hope this helps you out. Brought to you by www.1AAuto.com, your source for quality replacement parts and the best service on the internet. Please feel free to call us toll-free, 888-844-3393. We're the company that's here for you on the internet and in person. Handling, braking, acceleration, 
all depend on keeping the tires firmly planted on the ground. That's the job of the steering and suspension systems and our topic for this edition of The Trainer. If you watched last month's video, you know the focus was on tires and how important they are in maintaining the overall handling and stability of the vehicle. And it's all done through a contact patch about the size of my hand. But even the best tires in the world aren't going to be able to do their job if the steering and suspension systems can't keep that contact patch in contact with the pavement under a variety of conditions and if the control inputs that the driver is making through the steering wheel don't get to the tires where they need to go. So in this edition of the trainer, we're going to talk about inspecting the steering and suspension systems to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing so the tires can do what they're supposed to do. Keep the vehicle under control, keep the occupants safe. The inspection process begins just as you come up to the vehicle to bring it into the shop with a quick visual inspection. We're going to do a walk around and look at a few things of interest when it comes to looking at steering and suspension issues. Number one, what kind of condition are the tires in? Just a quick visual check as we're walking around the vehicle. And what about the ride height? Let's take a look at the ride height. Now, you can go formal with this, uh, get out your tape measure and so forth. But right now, I'm just looking at generalities, just trying to get a feel for the condition of the vehicle. And really, all I'm gonna do is take a look at the gap between the top of the tire and the fender on either side, just to give me a rough idea of what's going on. If one side is significantly different than the other, I know I got something I need to take a closer look at. We'll do the same for the back end. The one thing I'm not really going to be too worried about is the old bounce test. Some of these, like this uh, 13 Ram pickup, are pretty tough to get bouncing. And besides, they're not going to tell me a whole lot about the, the low end of the suspension's uh, dampening characteristics. What I mean by that is the small ripples, those things that make a difference in the ride quality of the vehicle while we're cruising down the highway. Um, I can't really tell that by a bounce test. If the shock's completely blown, yeah, I'll be able to tell that all right, but I'll probably also be able to tell that by a visual inspection because it'll probably be coated in fluid. Now once I've got my quick walk around done, I'm going to bring it into the shop for a closer inspection, but not directly. Maybe a little test ride just around the shop parking lot. Um, one of the things I want to do is get into small circles, lock to lock on the steering. I want to see how the steering feels. Uh, is it smooth through its entire range, going in both directions? Are there any abnormal noises? Um, maybe a few hard little stomps on the brake pedal so I can see how much dive there is in the suspension. Same on the acceleration. Maybe just a little blip on the throttle, see how much rise there is in the suspension. Is it more than I'm used to seeing on a particular model that I work on? Uh, if I have some bumps, speed bumps I can go over, so much the better. If you really want to do a good job with it, set up a little test drive area close to your shop that gives you a variety of conditions to operate the suspension and steering under. Uh, some corners, some uh, potholes, some speed bumps, whatever you can find so that your comparisons are on the same playing field with every vehicle you go and test drive. Okay, with the vehicle safely up in the air on the lift, we can move on to a closer inspection of the front end, the steering and suspension components. The first thing we're going to do is a quick tire inspection. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because we covered that last month. You can always look that up either at the Auto Pro Workshop, the Motor Age website, or our YouTube channel, of course. Uh, but I do want to reiterate here the type of wear that you see on the tires. If you see a sawtooth wear with the treads looking like this in either side, that usually indicates a problem with the toe angle. What's the toe angle, you might ask? If you look straight down from the top of the vehicle, uh, just like looking straight down at your feet, and if your feet are pointed pigeon-toed in or toed out, that's the same thing with the tires. So the tires are pigeon too far in, that's toe in, and if it's too far out, it's called toe out. So either one of those, if it's outside of specification, can cause that kind of wear on the tire. Uh, another thing I want to look for is uh, abnormal wear on either side. Maybe the left side or the uh, right side, the inner or outer, is wearing faster than the other. That could indicate a problem with the camber angle. What's camber? If you're looking straight ahead at the vehicle, the tire should point almost vertical. They are uh, designed to turn a little bit in or out. Again, camber in or camber out, uh, and that's uh, what you're looking at there. 
Too much, of course, would accelerate the wear on one side of that contact patch that we talked about last month and cause some issues there. Um, general choppiness in the tire, uh, rough wear, could indicate a problem with loose suspension components or uh, suspension parts that are worn. Uh, certainly the uh, shocks uh, could be worn, allowing that top tap patch to not stay in contact with the ground. Um, and of course you can't align a loose front end, so we want to make sure that all the parts are in good shape and tight before you even talk to the customer about doing an alignment on the car. Now once I've done that, uh, we talked about shaking the tire in uh, other videos. Here I'm going to focus at the uh, 9 and 3 o'clock position, and I'm looking primarily for play in the tie rod, the, uh, the steering uh, portion of the system. If I do feel any play, then what I like to do is reach behind and get a hold of that tie rod in while I wiggle the tire to see if I can tell whether it's the inner or outer that's causing the problem. Uh, once I've got that shake done, it's time to take it all the way up and do a visual on underneath. All right, there's a lot of things to look at up underneath the vehicle here. Right now in the frame, uh, center of the frame is the tie rod end, and primarily I want to make sure that that boot there is in good condition. A lot of the components on modern vehicles now come without grease fittings, so they're relying on the grease charge that they had when new to, to uh, keep them healthy for a long, long time. If those boots deteriorate or they're torn, of course that uh, grease charge will be lost, and then water can get in, corrosion can set in, uh, the part will very quickly wear out. Um, if it does have grease fittings, make sure that you grease them every time you have it in for an oil change. It's just part of the service. Uh, same thing here, looking at the lower ball joints and the upper ball joints. The boots are in good condition. We're also going to take a look at the stabilizer links to make sure their bushings are in good condition. They're not obviously broken, missing, as we come in on the sway bar itself and take a peek inside the second edition of those bushings. Are there any visual leaks underneath associated with the steering system? Of course, this structure is kind of interesting because it uses an electric steering system, as a lot uh, more cars and light trucks are doing. So you don't have any fluid leaks, but you still have the linkage to consider for wear and tear. Shocks, check those lower bushings and upper bushings for wear and tear. Take a good close look at the springs. Are they broken? Sagging? Any problem with the boots on the steering rack assembly? And if they're torn, that means road debris, water, dirt, all that can get in there. And that's just not good for the system. Better to replace the boot and replace a very expensive steering box. Of course, that suspension system inspection is not limited to the front. Shocks on the rear also need to be inspected. Look for any signs of leaks around the shock body. See if we can get in there. Now, a very light stain, that's normal. These are nice and clean. If it's running out though, that's a problem. Another thing you might want to consider with shocks is the age. Remember that uh, I mentioned earlier about handling those small bumps? Well, that's what it's doing all the time. In fact, I think the figures that I got from some manufacturers, over 50,000 miles, that shock's oscillating almost 8 million times. Those little steel wafers in there that control dampening on those very small irregularities will wear out, break, uh, just not provide the ride quality that it did when it was new. So there's nothing wrong with wearing a shock based on age. Just double check the OEM service information for any recommendations they might have. Same here with the track bar now. And make sure those bushings are in good shape. This is what helps in that steering stability. Don't need any issues there. And we'll double check the other side. Check the springs and the condition of the joust bumpers, front and rear. Before I go all the way down, I'm going to bring the vehicle just shy of the front tires in contact with of the uh, shop floor. Still got to check those ball joints. 
Okay, before I take the vehicle all the way down, I want to check the ball joints. Now, according to my friend Steve Cartwright, he's a garage guru with Federal Mogul, by the way, a common mistake that we make in the field is to not take the load off the ball, ball joints before we test them. So in this case, even though I'm racked on the frame, I'm using a floor jack to underneath the lower control arm and then raising some of that vehicle weight on that lower control arm to unload the ball joints. Now I can check them for play. What I'm gonna do now is just gonna stick a pry bar under the tire and feel for any up and down play. If I do see something there or feel something there, I'm gonna go behind, put part of my hand on the upper uh, control arm, the other part on the upper portion of the steering knuckle and do that again to see if I can feel that motion between those two components that would indicate the upper ball joint is the part that's at fault. If I don't see anything there, I'll move to the lower ball joint, do the same thing, see if the play exists there. Now ideally, you want to do it exactly the way the OEM tells you to. If I had any suspicion there was a problem with either joint, I'd have to go in and get a dial indicator, mount it per the OEM service procedure, and check exactly how much movement there is. On this particular Ram pickup, the spec is 20 thousandths of an inch max. Odds are, if you've been in this business for any length of time, you've seen more than one vehicle towed into your shop with a failed steering and suspension component that caused the tire to come completely out of alignment with the rest of the car. Odds are also pretty good that whoever ha that happened to ended up in a ditch as a result of that. Now we all know that we can't make consumers perform repairs that are needed on their car, but as professionals we can darn sure make sure that we check and inspect all the items that are safety related every time we have that car in our hands and advise their customers of what that vehicle needs. That's our part in keeping the roads safe for everyone. And with that little parting thought, I'll see you next month. Today we're going to be performing a brake inspection on a 2007 Toyota Corolla. Our necessary equipment that we're going to be needing today is a flashlight, a pry tool to get the hubcaps off, a socket and bolts to get the rear drums off, an impact gun to get the lug nuts off of the, the wheels, and a torque wrench to tighten the lug nuts back. Okay, now using gentle force we're going to use our pry bar to go all the way around, gently prying it up until it pops off and our lug nuts should be 21 on this one so we're going to go ahead and use our impact gun to go ahead and take those off so now we're going to go ahead and take off the tire and give a good look at the brakes so at this point we're going to go ahead and look at the brakes this customer has recently had brakes done judging by the cross hatching of the rotor which means it's brand new rotor and you can take a look at the pads through there and you can see there is tons of pad life. You're gonna have the rotor in the middle, then you're gonna have the pad and then the pad backing. So there is tons of life on the front of this vehicle. After inspecting the front of this, we're gonna go ahead and hand tighten these and using a torque wrench, we will actually torque them down to the recommended specifications. So we're gonna go ahead and pop off the, the rear hubcap now. Like I said, using gentle force. So go ahead and pull off your tire and expose the brake drum. So now we're going to use our two bolts to come in here and actually pull the, pull the drum off. Spin these in by hand and use your ratchet to gently start pulling the drum off. Go about five turns, go to the other side, 
And once you hear that little pop, generally means you can pull it off. And now we can inspect the actual brake drum. So just like when we inspected the front of this vehicle, we can tell that the rear has also been changed out. A general rule of thumb is you want to see about, you know, you want to see more pad, which this is your pad here and here, than you do backing. So if it's getting close to that backing, obviously your brake shoes are down to the point where it's time for a brake job. And at this point, it is a good, good, uh, good idea to look at the wheel cylinders, which are these which actually push the shoes out and compress it against the drum in order to stop. If you notice any residual wetness, that means your wheel cylinders are leaking and you need to replace them. Now that we have inspected it, we're gonna go ahead and set the drum back on and go ahead and put the tire back on. So here at the Auto Skill Center, we actually have a chart that tells us how tight the lug nuts need to be. So we're gonna go ahead and find our Toyota on here and it says all models 1986 to 2010 are 76 foot pounds. So as illustrated on our board, we need to set this to 76 foot-pounds. So we're gonna go ahead and spin it until you reach 70, and then go to 76, and lock your locking nut down. So as illustrated before, it's uh, 76 foot-pounds. We're gonna go ahead and torque these wheels down under its own weight in a star pattern. Some vehicles are gonna have four lugs, some are gonna have five, some are gonna have six, some are gonna have eight. But just, you know, make sure you do a crisscross pattern so you equal out the torquing across the wheel. With this torque wrench, you're gonna do it until you hear that, that click. Move to the next one, that click. Go to the next one. Now just double check all your bolts to make sure they're nice and tight. And set your hub cap on making sure that your that little notch is set up for the tire valve itself. There we go. Once you're done using the torque wrench, make sure you turn it down to zero or you can make the uh, torque wrench not inoperable, but it's not gonna be accurate anymore.